speakers today. And first, we are going to discuss the pediatric perspective of uh, rickets. And then we are going to discuss the nephrology aspects of uh, rickets. So first of all, you know, I'm so, so honored to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Thangavali, sir. As we all know, Dr. Thangavali, sir, is director of uh, Department of Pediatrics at Mehta's Children's Hospital. And he's also pediatric consultant here. Uh, he has formerly worked at Pediatric Intensive Care Unit in Madras Medical College. He has had over two decades of pediatric intensive care experience, and he has been a PALS instructor for more than two decades. He was the pioneer in establishing the Childhood Diabetes Clinic uh, way back in um, 1999. And till 2009, there were 400 children who were registered in this pediatric diabetes clinic. That was a pioneering effort, you know, way back when diabetes was still uh, not as uh, understood in children. Dr. Thangavalu, sir, has received multiple awards. Uh, he has received multiple best teaching awards, and he has mentored MD and DNB pediatric students for the last 25 years. We all owe it to Dr. Thangavalu, sir, for all his knowledge and sharing his experience in all these uh, years. He has received multiple orations. Uh, the most recent one being the Professor B.R. oration in 2021 and Professor Sohn's oration in February 2022. Dr. Thangavalu sir is also Editor-in-Chief of Indian Journal of Practical Pediatrics, and he has pu published multiple book chapters and journal articles. Once again, thank you, sir, for joining us today, sharing your uh, experience, and over to you, sir. morning and good evening. Thank you, Amrish, for your nice words. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kalivani and the organization team for the opportunity. Dear colleagues, senior teachers, Professor BRN and everyone. Rickets, a pediatrician's perspective. We always, in Indian culture, is to associate science and nature and to be studied together. This is the uh, Sun Temple of Konarak. This is a bright sunflower. The whole topic is going to be woven around the sun and vitamin D deficiency and rickets. These are the sub I am going to talk. History, metabolism, how bone grows, types and cause of rickets, algorithmic approach, clinical features, differential diagnosis, lab investigations, management, and vitamin D toxicity. See, way back in 1650, rickets were discovered. It was rampant in 19th century. To begin with, it was a very simple disease managed by cod liver oil, and those who did not, did not respond to cod liver oil, they labeled as uh, vitamin D resistant rickets put aside on the roadside. And then, and before going into that, we'll just see the vitamin D metabolism. Vitamin D is formed from sunlight as well as the food sources, D3, which is biologically inert. Then it is by 25 hydroxylation in the liver, the most abundant circulating form of vitamin D, uh, vitamin D3 is uh, produced. And then further, 125 hydroxylation of D3 in kidney, and then the active form is formed. Formation of 24, 25 hydroxy vitamin D3 is practically inert product. Now, initially to begin with, rickets was like a cottage industry managed by a practicing simple pediatrician. Later, now it is the last few centuries grown to a multinational uh, industry shares from many other specialities with the advent of growth of medicine in the form of physiology, biochemistry, radiology, and genetics. There are new specialities have shown interest in rickets, nephrologist, endocrinologist, and genetic specialist and biochemist. Bone growth depends on these factors. Initially, the cartilage growth, matrix formation, which gets calcified to form the bone, the mineralization depends on these five elements, vitamin D, PTH, phosphate, calcium, and an appropriate pH. All these are happening, balancing all these factors are balanced with the blessings from growth hormone and thyroid hormone, a hard, strong bone is formed. 
Rickets is a bone disease associated with, demineraliz with uh, demineralization of the growing bone and cartilage, secondary to defects in calcium and phosphorus homeostasis. Skeleton bony changes like deformities, enlarged bony ends, delayed closure of anterior fontanel, or neurological abnormalities like delayed motor milestones, afebrile seizures, and tetany. Most commonly, it is caused by vitamin D deficiency, causing softening and weakening of the bones. So bone formation, there are two components. One is the elaboration of the osteoid matrix, which is formed from collagen and osteocalcin. Second is subsequent mineralization by deposition of highly organized calcium phosphate crystals. When I looked at the bridge formation, it almost resembled the bone tissue. Now, initially, a steel frame is formed, something like the osteoid matrix. Over the matrix, over the matrix subsequent mineralization occurs. Here, they apply the cement. Now, in body, the calcium hydroxyapatite is used to for mineralize. And look at this video. Exactly reflects the bone tissue formation. Initially, osteoid, then mineralization. Where is the problem in osteogenesis imperfect on osteoporosis? It's a matrix. In Rickets and osteomalacia, it's mineralization. We all uh, just amazing to know how did Amida grow from a 50 centimeter child to 180 centimeters. It's all the growth plate which is responsible for linear growth and increasing the height. It's a long bone. There are two growth cartilage and both the end. The growth plate grows to the epiphyseal end, cartilage grows to the metaphyseal ends, it gets calcified. So both together, it enlarges, it lengthens the growth cartilage. This is a growth cartilage. These are called, called as physis. This is epiphysis, this is metaphysis. Same thing is shown here as an X-ray of the both. This growth cartilage has got four, five zones, depending on their activity. Zone one is zones of resting cartilage. Zone, zone two is a zone of proliferating cartilage, where the cartilage here it is quite an inert. Then cartilage, because of mitotic activity, it grows very fast and forms linear column and grows towards the diaphysis. So this is called a zone of proliferating cartilage. And then zone three, the zone, the cartilage, instead of growing more, it started bulging out more, called hypertrophic cartilage. When they become hypertrophied, the linear calcification ends, chokes the cartilage and cartilage become old and starts dying and they get calcified. These are all the five different zones in which the growth cartilage gets calcified. I probably, I would have read at least 20 times before understanding this. But any physiological process, I feel that it is always reflects the life cycle. So, reserve zone is something like a baby is quietly lying down happily without showing much activity. Then the proliferative zone is comparable to an active child and adolescent. Hypertrophic zone is compared to a middle age where everything bulges out. And by calcification zone, the old man dies and forms a calcified bone, and the next generation repeats. This is how the life cycle begins and ends and continues to have new, more and more osteogenesis and calcification. This video I just borrowed from NET, but running for two minutes, I really surprised to know how the lengthening occurs in the bone. This video is self-explanatory with nice pictures, descriptions, and comments.
hope you enjoy the video here this this is a hypertrophic normal growth plate where the hypertrophied uh, chondrocytes become old and die and they develop apoptosis self death apoptosis of the hyper, uh, hypertrophic chondrocytes is caused by phosphate ions in now, now in rickets there is hypoperfusion leads to no apoptosis so all this hyaline cartilage hypertrophic cartilage proliferate and causes softening and start bulging out and that is responsible for the are the clinical features of rickets including the widening of the physis from this pathophysiology uh, from the mechanism of rickets we move on to etiology and types in in general uh, etiology is uh, rickets is classified into nutritional and non nutritional based on the etiology nutritional where we don't get enough sunshine exposure or low dietary intake nutritional deficiency if it is non nutritional that is divided into two major groups renal and non renal this flow chart probably will be useful to go through that a clinical biochemical radiological um indications lead to suspicion of rickets before making the diagnosis of rickets you also think about rickets mimics which closely resemble mimics but there is some differences what are those mimics which are metaphysical dysplasia and hypophosphatasia they are not rickets but the radiological appearance very closely resembles then if we exclude the mimics the rickets is classified into non nutritional and nutritional nutritional as we discussed earlier renal and non renal gastroenterological and hepatic ge and hepatic renal and disorders of vitamin d metabolism these are the next major three groups ge and hepatic usually most of the time the etiology is very obvious a child with neonatal cholestasis wilson disease or malabsorption syndrome is easier to make the diagnosis only then we have to look for the features of rickets and renal again the clinical radiological and biochemical parameters clinches the diagnosis of renal rickets where renal tubular acidosis renal osteodystrophy hypophosphatemia and pancreatic syndrome are included if we take the disorders of vitamin d metabolism prominent things are vdd are type 1 and vdd are type 2 in addition just an anti convulsion therapy also interferes with the metabolism of vitamin d that also leads to disorders of vitamin d metabolism so what is vitamin d deficiency rickets various causes nutritional or malabsorption or due to 25 hydroxylation or increased catabolism because of enzyme inducing drugs like anti convulsions or vitamin d dependent or resistant rickets type 1 type 2 all these type of rickets are classified as vitamin d deficiency or vitamin d associated rickets or osteomalacia next group is calcium deficiency rickets where this is a this is an entity i don't say new but again it has been seen in african and indian uh, subcontinent this type of deficiency where calcium is deficient but uh, now with a normal vitamin d status how does it occur normally a child consuming very low dietary calcium intake less than 300 mg either because of reduced intake or malabsorption leads to hypocalcemic rickets or due to hypercalciuria studies from africa and indian subcontinent highlighted the role of low dietary calcium intake in the pathogenesis of rickets which is called as calcium deficiency rickets again our diet like cereals interfere with absorption of calcium leads to calcium deficiency rickets hypophosphate rickets are uh, uh, this is the major group comes under renal etiology ga causes are any child like a poor intake or breastfed uh, very low birth weight infant chronic diarrhea excessive phosphate binder these are all the reasons but major group of hypophosphate rickets comes under renal uh, etiology tumor induced osteomalacia fanconi different types of excellent dominant autosomal dominant autosomal recessive hereditary hypophosphate rickets and dent disease all these there are a lot of genetic association is there as i said earlier rickets is also being analyzed by biochemists nephrologists endocrinologists and all the way geneticist how do you classify biochemically which we have seen already calcium deficiency rickets or phosphate deficiency rickets calcium deficiency invariably associated secondary hyperparathyroidism phosphate deficiency there is no secondary hyperparathyroidism here the rickets occurs with malabsorption hepatic disease and aed here it is fanconi syndrome rt or oncogenic rickets which you have seen earlier this slide i borrow from professor zul mugal powerpoint presentation this is a new thought which has been infused is both calcipenia rickets and phosphopenia rickets leads to hypophosphatemia of course hypophosphatemia rickets invariably like hypophosphatemia is there but in hals calcipenia rickets what happens is it simulates a pth secretion pth cause renal phosphate wastage 
and resulting in low serum phosphate hyperphosphatemia the hyperphosphatemia is the key factor which causes impact apoptosis of the terminally differentiated chondrocytes in the hypertrophied zone apoptosis means self death impact apoptosis of terminally differentiated chondrocytes in the growth plate normally the apoptosis leads to death of the chondrocytes and calcification that is a normal bone formation which is becomes disorder because of the phosphate deficiency leading to loss of apoptosis and hypertrophy of the already uh, present chondrocytes leading to softening and bulging out which are responsible for all the clinical manifestations of rickets so what are the difference between calcipenic and hypophosphatemic rickets in calcipenic rickets because calcium is associated with a lot of other vital functions there will be muscle weakness bone bony pains will be there all limbs will be involved there may be tetany and there will be enamel hyperplasia but in hypophosphatemic rickets muscle weakness will be absent bone pain will not be there predominantly it affects lower limbs because children with hypophosphatemic rickets develop once they start walking so predominantly it affects the lower limb and compared to the calcipenic rickets where all the four limbs are affected dental laps are common in uh, hypophosphatemic rickets serum calcium will be low in uh, calcipenic rickets but normal in hypophosphatemic rickets these are all the various differences of course pth is elevated in calcipenic rickets normal in hypophosphatemic rickets so we have seen different types in etiology of rickets we'll move on to the clinical features the clinical features of rickets depend on the age of presentation this typically includes decreased longitudinal growth widening of the metaphyseal zones zones as we have seen earlier because of the excessive osteoid and defective mineralization leading to painful swelling around these zones first three months are life most of the time it is secondary to the mental vitamin d deficiency uh, first three months of life first six months of life they usually even before the bony deformity develop they develop symptomatic hypocalcemia presenting as convulsions apneic spells and twitching so whenever we see a child in neurological manifestation the first six months one should consider the possibility of vitamin d deficiency the bone deformity is more commonly seen between 6 to 18 months of age when the child started moving around ambulant so till that time the manifestations are different what are skeletal manifestation cranial tabes delayed closure of af frontal and peripheral parietal bossing delayed eruption of primary tooth enamel defects enlargement of the bones around the wrists and ankles sometimes it is called as double malleolus bow legs knock knee sandy carving of the legs coxa vera deformities of the spine pelvis and leg green stick fractures rachitic dwarfism as we as uh, we discussed earlier lower extremities deformity are more common in familial hypophosphatemic rickets both upper and lower limbs are more, more involved in hypocalcemic rickets see here you see a child with uh, rickety rosary rickety rosary is better seen on the sides if you draw a line from the nipple parallel to the costal margins you will see the swelling of the anterior ends better seen when you look at a child from the lateral side is called rickety rosary both these are both these kids are of same age group because of chronic rickets the child will have short stage sometimes they can present as a dwarf bow legs knock knees are genu valgum enlarged bony ends of uh, around the ankle around the wrist you can see the enlargement of the bony swelling around the wrist here they they can have harrison sulcus harrison sulcus can occur in three conditions one is a soft bone pulled by a normal diaphragm as in rickets or excessive respiratory distress and pulling up a normal skeletal uh, structure in the form of recurrent asthma or recurrent respiratory distress as in congenital heart disease severe deformity as in vdd are type 2 and all they may have a severe deformity involving all the limbs chest and abdomen leading to violin box like chest and deformity is usually seen in resistant rickets of course we are not good people to identify but we should be aware about how the enamel of a vitamin d deficiency rickets calcipenic rickets will appear probably this is something like a pattern reading we can identify the enamel hypoplasia will be identified as brown spots and pitted irregular tooth enamel as in calc uh, or sometimes it will be seen as an erosion appears as smoothy silky appearance glazed surface hypophosphatemic rickets multiple dental lapses is the presentation so tooth may be an indicator of rickets what are the extra skeletal manifestation seizures tetany hypotonia proximal myopathy and delayed motor development badling gait sometimes they can present with dilated cardiomyopathy this is another rare but not very uncommon presentation in addition protuberant abdomen bone pain in older children delayed eruption of teeth increased sweating 
propensity to lower respiratory tract infection. All these are little uncommon manifestations of rickets. This is an adolescent boy came to us with tetany. The classical tetany turned out to be a feature of severe vitamin D deficiency. This child, 14 months old child, came in the early morning to pick with fever, breathlessness, tachycardia, respiratory distress, hepatomegaly. So all of this we can explain. So cardiomegaly is there, the cardiac failure is there. Naturally, all these are explained. Why this child develops seizures? So we should take an opportunity, any chest x-ray taken for lung and heart disease, we should take the opportunity to look at the upper end of the humerus. Upper end of the humerus is ready to show you the diagnosis. If you look at the upper end of the humerus, it is different from a normal upper end of the humerus. It's a normal upper end of the humerus. You can see a well-defined margins, no serrated edges. There is no widening of the physes. Here you can see the irregular metaphysical regions, widened physes. If you closely observe, you can see the dilated anterior ends of the ribs. Here it is almost bulging out, caused by the indicated by the orange arrows. So this gave us the clue that uh, the child seizure is due to calcipenia and INS calcium level was very low. Child had cardiomegaly, pulmonary condition, evidence of rickets in the upper end of the humerus, INS calcium was 0.8 millimoles. Echo done show, did not show any anatomical defect, turned out to be vitamin D deficiency cardiomyopathy. And X-ray also, also showed these levels. And then with vitamin D replacement, completely child recovered. So just by looking at the upper end of the humerus, any child with seizure, you can identify rickets or other condition like lead poisoning can be identified. This child present with the fracture, fall, fell down from the cart, a two-year-old boy, but he had fractures. But uh, in, in medicine, you should not get satisfied with one finding. You should look for anything more, anything more. When you look at it again, the child has got a classical feature of the rickets. So, widening of the physes, irregular metaphysical ends. Now, you explain the reason for the fractures. This is because of the vitamin D deficiency leading to pathological fracture. This is a five months old child present with bronchiolitis, respiratory distress. In addition to respiratory distress, which the upper end of the humor, if you look at it, it definitely shows an irregular margins. It raises a doubt whether it could be due to deficiency, vitamin D deficiency. Again, look at the anterior ends of the ribs. You can see the dilated anterior ends of the ribs, giving a clue to the Rickets, vitamin D level confirmed the diagnosis. It was 6.47, PTH was Y. You can see the X-ray is showing cupping, yellow, yellow arrow, fraying showing by shown by brown arrow, and widening shown by the blue arrow, double-headed arrow. So this is confirmed by the X-ray risk as well as the vitamin D levels. Calcium was low, uh, alkaline phosphate is high. The classical rickets, in addition to bronchiolitis, the child present with asymptomatic child. So how do they present to different specialities? The general pediatrician may be an incidental clinical finding or radiological finding. Or for a neurologist or a general pediatrician, they present delayed milestones, not walking or seizures. They can present bone deformities and abnormal walking to an orthopedic surgeon, hypocalcemic seizure to a pediatric intensivist. They can present with chronic renal problems and bony deformities to a pediatric nephrologist. This is a variety of presentation of rickets. Again, a, a neonatologist or a, or a pediatrician so seeing young children can also identify the metabolic bone disease because transfer of calcium and phosphorus occurs only in the third uh, rhymester. 130 to 140 milligram of calcium and 70 to 80 milligram of phosphorus are transferred to the baby. And uh, the, the baby is delivered prematurely. Baby did not get this asset from the mother and leading to metabolic bone disease or the rickets of prematurity. Here, in addion to the vitamin D deficiency, also may be an additional risk factor. Other contributing factors are prolonged parental nutrition, vitamin D and calcium, small absorption, diuretics, and urinary calcium losses are other contributing factors. Usually, they present with progressive osteopenia, hemodialis bone, sometimes pathological fractures. Alkaline phosphatase, raised alkaline phosphatase is a very good indicator that we are dealing with the child with osteoporosis prematurity. Now, when we treat the child, serum phosphate should be targeted to 4 to 5 milligram, vitamin D to more than 20 nanograms. And uh, the raised SAP should decrease. Generally, they are treated by additional oral supplements of calcium and phosphate. And with vitamin D, somewhere between 400,000, unless child got a cholestasis, where probably you'll have to give a higher dose of vitamin D. Now, adolescent, they usually present with the tetany or with the bony deformities involved in the lower limbs. 
This we already see, you know, dilator anterior of the ribs, which is also a feature of rickets. And this is a picture, this is a case report published in a Journal of Forensic Pathology. It's a three months old female infant died following fall from a cart and pneumonia in Canada. As a routine, postpartum skeletal survey was done. An autopsy was done to identify the cause of death in this child. They identified pneumonia. In addition to that, they also identified the bulbous swelling of the costochondral junction. We never saw, because we have seen the bulbous chondrosal only in the live patient in x-rays, we have never seen this. The postmortem has shown the bulbous enlargement. You can also see a callus in the posterior edge. This is also shown in the x-ray. This is a case report published in the Academic Forensic Pathology. Of this is for the interest of the exam going PGs. These are all the points which list in the history. I'll ra rapidly read out. Delay in standing and walking, recurrent diarrhea, oily stools, recurrent breathlessness, seizures, anti-canvalent therapy, how, how many hours that child spend in outdoor play, what are the diet they are taking, is there any alopecia, polyuria, edema, family history, treatment details, other deficient signs like night blindness, recurrent respiratory infection, forehead sweating, tetany and stridor should elicit. The examination, you should look for ping pong feel of the skull, weed antifontanel, chest deformities, limb deformities, eye finding like jaundice and cataract, tooth finding and skin finding. These are all the things you should look at a child with presenting with rickets in the examination. So we have seen the clinical features, clinical presentation, move on to lab investigations. Lab investigation, of course, every child may not need a extensive, broad battery of investigations. The basic investigation which I really needed is calcium, phosphate, and alkaline phosphatase, and of course, vitamin D. Of course, vitamin D serum level estimation has come up available to us only in the last maybe 10 years. Before 2010, we never had an opportunity to check the serum. Vitamin D levels is not available for us. So low serum, cal low or normal serum calcium, low phosphate, increased alkaline phosphatase are the classical features. With urea and alkalase may be helpful to identify renal cavity alveoli kits. X-ray means so classical disappearance of zone of calcification, widening, fraying. Fraying means irregular the metaphysis. Widening is the gap between the epiphysis and uh, metaphysis, widening. And the cupping of the distal lens. You can, here you can see the cupping. Cupping, fraying, widening of the physis will be the classical features, radiological features of rickets. Here you can see that this is the physis showing widening. Here you can see in the x-ray. This is a child uh, x-ray of child, the active rickets. You can see the act features of active rickets. Once you start treating the child, if you take an x-ray after two to four weeks, you can see the provisional zone of calcification. This is a uh, shown by the uh, yellow arrow, thin arrow. You can see the provisional zone of calcification. This will reassure us saying that it is only nutrition deficiency. May not need extensive investigation because this is a sign of healing rickets. We closely observe, you can see the difference. This is a line appearing because of the provisional zone of calcium. It was not there in the active rickets. It's, a, it's an evidence of healing rickets because the line of preparatory calcification is start appeared. What is Harris growth thrust line? We have seen some of some time we will see these lines called Harris growth thrust lines. What they say is the trans, transverse lines parallel to the epiphysis or metaphysis. What happens is during growth, radiological appearance and clinical, clinical appearance appears, clinical and biological appearance, healing appears earlier, radiological appearance takes longer time. If we go through that five zones we saw, which are uh, resting zone, proliferative zone, hypertrophic zone, and calcification zone. Remember that in the hypertrophic zone, there is no vertical column moving around. Vertical column is moving down for the promotion of the development of osteo tissue. That is not there in the presence of in the deficiency of vitamin D. So osteoblast cannot cause osteo formation in the vertical direction. Instead, it started working on the horizontal direction. So these are all the evidence of healed rickets, old rickets, something like a scar of rickets. They are called as Harris growth thrust line. It may be seen in the normal limb normal bones. Second investigation, renal investigation, urea, nalaclase, ABG, tubular reabsorption of phosphate, urine analysis for specific gravity, glucose protein, amino acid, potassium, calcium, used abdomen, LFT, malabsorption, IEM studies. When we, when the pediatrician go for these investigations, better to do in a lab which has got more experience in these investigations under the guidance of a nephrologist. Otherwise, we may not get a correct result. Of course, tertiary investigations, we generally we do it Simultaneous estimation of VDDR in 25-hydroxyvitamin uh, D levels and 125-hydroxyvitamin D levels to identify VDDR type 1 and type 2. Whatever we assess the vitamin D levels is only 25-hydroxy because that is the main thing. 
125 hydroxy vitamin D levels routinely we don't assess because the half life of that lasts only for less than one hour. So whatever we assess is only the 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. These are all the tertiary level investigation. Here again, it should be done under the advice of the pediatric nephrologist. After the lab test, this is a nutshell. The clinical and ideological features are rickets are there, but calcium, phosphate, and SAP are normal means it is a metabolic displacement. It's not rickets, it's a rickets mimic. Clinically rickets, but SAP is very low. The only condition where SAP will be low in the background of rickets is hypophosphate ACR. Clinical and radiological rickets, but calcium is normal, but phosphate is very low means it is a hypophosphate rickets. Clinical radiological rickets, calcium is low, PTH is high, but phosphate is normal. 25 hydroxy vitamin D level is normal. You think in terms of vitamin D deficiency rickets, but uh, you see that uh, vitamin D, uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are normal, then you think, start thinking about VDDR type 1. 25 hydroxy levels are low, 125 also low, it is type 2. Your simple investigation in the diagnosis of rickets, if you do a simple urine test, the child has got a proteinuria glycosuria and severe failure to thrive, short stature, it is in evidence of Fanconi syndrome. By urea creatinine in last year dystrophy. So, the basic investigation will give a great clue about the underlying cause. Now, we'll move on to differential diagnosis. We we'll look at this one. These are the mimics, differential diagnosis, and metaphysical dysplasia and hypophosphate rickets is the mimics. Are the different etiology like gastroenterological, hepatic problem, renal problem, and disorders of vitamin D metabolism? The DD, main DD is a mimics, which is metaphysical dysplasia or mucopolis like Marcus is very closely resembled rickets. But here, the calcium, phosphate, alkaline level, phosphate level will be normal, unlike in rickets. But radiological changes may get confused with the ricket. Hypophosphate ACA, as we said earlier, ALP level is very low. This is the only situation where you will get a low ALP levels. So, when you see a picture like this, better not to give a trial of vitamin D. Those who are in the periphery could not do the vitamin D levels. After seeing this, better you refer to a child to a um, referral center for further evaluation because giving more and more vitamin D will result in vitamin D toxicity. So, now we will have you made a diagnosis of rickets. Now, there are five questions for further evaluation of etiology. I just put forward five questions. Is it rickets or rickets like states? If rickets, is it nutritional or non-nutritional? If non-nutritional, is it renal or non-renal? If renal, what is the underlying renal problem? If non-nutritional, whether it is GA, hepatic, or metabolic, or miscellaneous causes. So, first question is, is it rickets or rickets mimic? If there is rickets, whether it is non-nutritional or nutritional, if non-nutritional, or non-renal or renal, if it is renal, it is also the renal failure or without renal failure. Without renal failure means it's RTA, Fanconi syndrome, familial hypoxia rickets. Renal failure means renal osteodystrophy. So, if we come to the conclusion, non-renal is stage 5, left out are GA or liver etiology, metabolic causes and miscellaneous. So, we will try to answer the first question. We have seen a child rickets. First question he asked, is it true rickets or rickets like states? So, do the preliminary investigations, serum, calcium, phosphate and alkaline. But these three should be abnormal in rickets. If these are serum, calcium, phosphate are normal, it is indicative of metabolic dysplasia. If SAP, instead of high SAP, if expect a low SAP, it is an evidence of hypophosphate. So, to repeat again, in metabolism dysplasia, the features may mimic rickets, but growth plate is not wide. There is differential involvement of bones. The femur may show, pelvis may show features of rickets, but uh, the tibia and ulna may be normal. Levels of serum, calcium, phosphate and alkaline phosphate will be normal in metabolism dysplasia. So this is an X-ray pelvis of a child with a metaphysical dysplasia. We look at this X-ray, showing some irregularity of uh, metaphysical lens. So it raises a concern whether it could be rickets. But there is no widening of the physis. Here you see the widening of the physis. Here the widening of the physis is not seen, so it is unlikely to be rickets. Again, pelvis shows some irregularity, but this does not show irregularity. The differential involvement is in favor of metaphysical dysplasia. If you look at it again, See, this is a child with metaphysical dysplasia. See, the, there is irregularity is there, but physis is not widened. But here is a child with rickets. Here you can see the significant widening of the physis. So, differential involvement of the bones and then absence of widened physis. And these are all the features to suggest that it is metaphysical dysplasia and not rickets. Again, this is a child, both resembles that of rickets, but in rickets, calcium is low, phosphate normal. Alkaline phosphate is high, vitamin D is low, but in metaphysical dysplasia, 
X-ray gives some confusion about rickets, but see calcium, phosphate, SAP, vitamin D, everything is normal. This is metabolic dysplasia. If everybody starts giving vitamin D, high dose of vitamin D for the child, the child will finally end up with vitamin D toxicity. This is a child mark you see classical features. You see the protuberant chest, the new uh, You can see that this child's X-ray shows that the irregularity is there, but there is no widening of the physis. This is the physis is normal here. But here the physis is white and yellow double arrow is the physis. So always look for these features to, before making the diagnosis of this is a hypophosphate a report and x-ray taken from Nelson, two months old baby with uh, bent bones. So you see the bent femur, serum alkaline phosphate level is low, calcium is higher. This is suggests your hypophosphatasia, more eaten appearance of the humerus. Treatment is bone marrow transplant, uh, recumbent alkaline phosphatase. So now we come to the next question. Is it nutritional or non-nutritional? So when will you think of nutritional etiology? If you think from the beginning itself, you think of non-nutritional etiology, it's better that a pediatrician should not treat. Rather, he can refer the child to a center where every investigation can be done, can opinion, get the opinion from a nephrologist. What are the features to say that is non-nutritional? The classical present in nutritional records between six months to two years. We happen to see a child with the rickets before six months or after two years of age, it is highly likely that it may be a non-nutrition rickets. Presence of associated failure to pray. Generally, our teachers used to say that most of the time, child rickets will not be malnourished because the active growth is needed for the manifestation of rickets. So the child does not have, it has failure to thrive. And there is positive family history and presence of obvious clues in the examination. Then you always think about non-nutrition rickets. Or finally, you think it is a nutritional record, so you give vitamin D adequately and after four or six weeks, you see the child does not show any clinical or radiological recovery, then you think in terms of vitamin D, it is a non-nutritional record. These are some more clues, a premature child, unit cholestasis, anti therapy, chronic renal disease, all these are a feature of non-nutritional records. A child with record shows jaundice means it may be a hepatobiliary disease or a metabolic disorder leading to records. It's not nutritional records. There is cataract, what are the possible causes? Again, it's not nutritional. It may be due to galactosemia, Wilson's disease, or Lowy disease, all the metabolic disorder that leads to rickets as well as cataract. Positive family history, a child with metabolic disease or RTA, can have positive family history. So it is again, it's non-nutritional. Child got mental retardation and seizures is very obvious it is non-nutritional. Can seem be seen in galactosemia or drug induced rickets in the primary sinus problem. Alopecia again suggests the presence of VDDI type 2. You can suspect evaluation and suspect a child with failure to thrive, polyuria, recurrent admission for phosphating and dehydration, renal stone disease are pointers to us non nutrition etiology, more likely a renal tubular disorder. A lab investigation showing, showing low bicarb, low sodium, low potassium again suggests. Raised urea gradient, all these features suggest that it is non nutritional. Once before starting vitamin D, we should think that whether it, if, if we have the the facilities to check the vitamin D, you can check and start the treatment. If you don't have the facilities, all these clues give an ETL, give a suggestion that it may be non nutritional better, refer the child to a higher center. This is a classical nutrition. This, this family do not, did not believe in max and did not believe in vitamins, did not believe in proper diet. They were taking something which is not congenial for the growth of the child. Thin built child, two years old of years, the child has not started walking. See the classical features of rickets, widened physis, you can see the irregularity, metaphysical irregularity, cupping is there, better seen in the ulna, vitamin D level was very low, PTH was high, SCP was high, and then we gave active vitamin D oral granules. After that, three months later, you can see the progress of calcification, and almost in April, almost six months later, the completely healed rickets. It's a classical nutrition rickets, proved by vitamin D levels, proved by the response to vitamin D. So again, another child, vitamin D deficiency rickets, you can see the classical features of the rickets. February, and after four months, you can see the completely healed rickets. Vitamin D level were 5.29. If non-nutritional, what are we going to do? The clinical clues of non-rickets, lab investigation, input from media nephrologists, the child definitely need further evaluation in a higher center. Better we will refer to a higher center for detailed evaluation. Okay, now I have clearly thought it is a nutritional request, how I'm going to treat. So the decision of treatment based on two things. One is whether it's a stable child or a child, particularly ill child with seizures. 
or presence or absence of clues for non-nutrition rickets. In a periodic center, most likely vitamin D deficiency rickets, but before starting the treatment, it's better that look for the clues as we have discussed earlier. If possible, we have facilities that are available, take the help of periodic nephrologist and it will make the job earlier in the beginning itself. The earlier, the practice what for we followed before 2010 was any child with rickets, we will give a mega, mega dose of 3 lakh intense units of arachitol. Most of the people of my age group will remember that. 3 lakhs or to 6 lakhs of international units of IM you know, vitamin D will be given. And then the parents will be asked to bring their child after 4 weeks, 4 to 6 weeks to repeat the x-ray to look for the x-ray appearance, x-ray improvement. Sometimes we will wait for 8 weeks. So this practice should be abandoned because... Now the facilities are available to check the vitamin D levels. Now we have facilities, nephrologists are available and investigation available. So this practice should be abandoned now. Now nobody gives high patients. This is stable child nutrition leakage. Uh, child does not have seizures. This is the standard treatment guidelines beautifully given by Indian Academy of Pediatrics, standard treatment guideline. Below six months, the large dose of oral larger granules are to be avoided. The general is 2,000 international units of vitamin D to be given for 90 days, along with 50 to 70 milligram per kg of calcium. But in six months to one year, you can give larger doses, 30,000 international units fortnightly for six weeks, or 60,000 monthly for three doses. In addition to that, you can give calcium. Or if the child is, can cooperate, we can give even still a daily or so dose is possible. And above one year, generally, 3,000 international units daily for 90 days, or 60,000 international units of oral granules for five doses, along with 50 to 70 milligram per kg per day of calcium, which is 500 milligram per day of oral calcium. This is the standard treatment guideline prescribed by Indian Academy of Pediatrics, which works very well. It is easy for us to follow. But on the other hand, is we had a child recently. This is a child came with afebrile seizures. X-ray showed classical rickets. The vitamin D level was low, 7 nanogram. Ionous calcium was 0.6. The child was admitted with two, three episodes of seizure in ICU. Here, the same thing we can't follow. Here, only treat this child. Severe deficient hypocalcium seizure needs a three-tier management. This three-tier management, I thought I can compare with the diarrhea severe dehydration management because we are all of the pediatricians are familiar with diarrhea management. Diarrhea and severe dehydration. Initially, we will give a fluid ball. Child comes with shock. Initially, we will give a fluid bolus. Once shock is correct, you go for deficit correction and then give the maintenance fluid. Same way, you can give, similar to fluid bolus, we can give IV calcium gluconate plus Calcitriol is active form of vitamin D. This is an indication for active form of vitamin D. 0 0.05 microgram per kg, maximum 0.5 microgram, or for at least three to four weeks till the calcium levels are normalized. With the low calcium level, low vitamin D level, we can't send the child out of the hospital. So we have to start with IV calcium and calcitriol as active calcium vitamin D. In addition to, uh, in addition to the routine vitamin D granules, 63 interaction units for six weeks, once uh, the child is stabilized, then it can be followed with maintenance dose of 400 to 600 units per day plus oral calcium. These are various preparations, alpha calcitriol, calcitriol, dihydrotachistrol. Of course, IM injection is now completely out of service. The vitamin D therapy is a general pulse of vitamin D therapy is for deficient rickets, only 25 hydroxy vitamin D is used. 125 hydroxy vitamin D is, is used in selective situations in media type 1, CKD, hypocalcemic seizures or cardiomyopathy or hyperparathyroidism. STARS therapy should not be used, IM stars should not be used in any age group. Oral large dose should not be used less than six months. Always check the strength of oral vitamin D because strength available is alarmingly frightening. Right from 400 units to 800, 1000, 2000, 60,000 internal units are available with the same name, same appearance. We have to be very, very careful. Vitamin D can be given irrespective of meal timing, anytime. Always combine with the calcium because to avoid hungry bone syndrome. Preferable calcium is calcium carbonate because of high available, bioavailability. Why is poverty? I mean, so, so much, we have so much of sunlight, so much of sunlight. In fact, in our childhood, we would have spent at least six to eight hours during our holidays in sunlight only. There are all the various negative factors. Why, despite bright sunlight, we don't get, our children do not get an epitamine D's latitude and season, exposure to sun time, atmosphere, indoor living, window glass blocks, dress codes and customs, darker skin pigmentation, very important uh, added factor is the computer games. All these phones and computer games make our child stuck to the indoor games. Of course, diet is a very poor, uh, uh, very poor substitute for sunlight, but these are all some of the food made which are available, where vitamin D available is uh, supplemented cow milk, 
cereals are poor sources butter and margarine a difficult type of dishes how many fortifications are some of the vitamin d source rich sources see our children are kept in two different environments here multi story building they never see sunlight they only near the window they sit only when they sit near the window will get sunlight all the time they spend inside our room they don't have space to go out and play as in villages in another situation we have an unprotected child see the construction situation child is kept unprotected when the workers are working there so over protected children protect from sunlight leading to rickets primary prevention public education need for vitamin d supplement is breastfed infants secondary prevention is identification of vitamin d deficiency and treating them secondary and tertiary this i want to spend some time even though i have little time beware highly prone for medication errors very very highly prone same name with different see see the same name this is 400 international units this is 800 then 400 and then 60000 international units. same bottle see the bottles are similar 10 ml bottles this contains 400 international units or 800 international units this contains 60000 international units very easily if somebody mistakes a person who dispenses the drug from the chem, uh, chemical uh, uh, pharmaceutical shop will definitely give uh, wrong medicine so i always make it as a habit to write it clearly explain to them show the numbers i will ask them to insist that they have to come back and show the medicine then only i'll ask them to go because even with a good writing good count good the prescription counter check the medicines to avoid the serious errors this is one of the paper published from our friends from north india in order an eranis prescription vitamin d beyond recommended dosage 10 months old infant present hypertension bilateral nephrocalcemia turned out to be vitamin d toxicity hypercalcemia two year old girl with mimicking acute battery meningitis because of seizures and encephalopathy third child is a mild symptom like constipation irritability and investigation showed moderate hypercalcemia all this can be prevented once we write our prescription in capital letters and counter check the medicines prescribed by the chemist this is quickly i'll go through on the three two three slides only this is from australia 126 cases from 1990 to 2003 steady increasing rickets hypocalcemia seizure in 33 percent bowel lex in 22 percent this again from uh, kerala 54 cases and nutritional rickets predominantly between 1 to 2 years age group 45 percent 85 percent 83 percent had elevated serum alp which will be a good uh, measurement to identify rickets this is civil hospital karachi 159 enrolled participants out of that uh, vitamin d deficiency was 75% so we come to the end of it so every pediatrician when the child comes for uh, well health visits we should look for signs of rickets when we assess the development we can identify vitamin d deficiency earlier and we should be able to differentiate vitamin d deficiency rickets from non nutritional rickets it is vitamin d deficiency in our arena to treat we should try to identify non nutritional at the beginning itself so that we can refer to higher centers to identify earlier and treat i am always grateful to my teachers professor b r namal lor and professor m vijay kumar for teaching me the fine respect of rickets uh, i i am thankful to dr sunil reddy our fellow for helping me in editing thank you very much i think i have exceeded by 5 minutes on my time thank you very much for your patient listening thank you so much dr thangavalu sir again this has been an excellent excellent lecture and your simple examples and simple slides and a simple approach you know that sticks with us for so long so again thank you so much uh, for your wonderful you. talk and uh, we'll have the questions uh, at the end uh, when the second talk uh, is done uh, just to let uh, the attendees know that at the end we are also going to announce the winners of the polling session so please stay tuned and uh, wait for the final results meanwhile i also want to uh, Welcome, Dr. Namalwar, sir. He had joined us earlier. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Namalwar, sir, for joining. And then uh, I would like to introduce the next speaker for today. And our next speaker is Dr. Amol Madwe, who is an assistant professor in pediatrics and pediatric nephrology at MGM Institute of Health Sciences in Navi Mumbai. He is also a visiting pediatric nephrologist at Jupiter Hospital in Thane. His special interests. is critical care nephrology and he is also the coordinator for international pediatric nephrology association and indian society of pediatric nephrology renal replacement therapy registry he is also the life member of kidney foundation for children he is a dynamic pediatric nephrologist and we would like to welcome him to share a nephrologist perspective on rickets welcome amol thank you thank you dr jain 
and a very good evening and a good morning to all the attendees. Uh, a very warm good evening to Namalwar sir. I can see sir is there. And a big thank you to Tangavelu sir uh, for teaching us crickets when we were students. And it's really a proud moment that uh, I get to share this platform with him uh, in front of this August audience. If I may, I can share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, it is. You can put it to slideshow and we should be good and go. Is this fine? Yeah. Looks great. Okay. So good evening. Yeah. So good evening, everyone. Uh, so I think Amalwar sir and Tangavelu sir, whatever sir, they have taught us in so many years. I'll just put it in a little different perspective. It is the same looking from this angle or that angle. Eventually it's rickets. So the pathophysiology remains same, the treatment will remain same, just trying to see rickets from a different perspective. So usually when does a child come to a pediatric subspecialist? So first and foremost reason when the child comes is when there is an inadequate response or no response to treatment that is given to the child. Or if the pediatrician or the primary care doctor feels that there are additional clinical features which do not fix into the puzzle, of a normal nutritional rickets, he thinks there is something more to it. Or there is a family member who has been affected with a similar condition, either a parent or a sibling, which prompts for a referral or an investigation that has come abnormal while you are evaluating, so you refer to a higher center. If we are lucky, the patient directly comes up to us because he has heard that somebody is a bone doctor, he might land up with a pediatric nephrologist directly. So even before we start investigating for a possible non-nutritional rickets, the first and foremost important thing is to ensure that the patient has received adequate and complete therapy and more importantly, whether he or she was compliant. Just as Tangavalu sir showed us, there are multiple preparations of vitamin D available in the market. Like there is a fear of being overdosed with vitamin D, there is a possibility that the child would have been underdosed, that he went and bought a preparation which was much lower, took it for a lot of time without knowledge that he was taking wrong medicine and probably he did not develop adequate response. So there's a global consensus on nutritional rickets which has recommended for children less than one year of age to have 2000 units of vitamin D. For children between one years and 12 years, 3000 to 6000 units per day and for those older than 12 years, about 6000 units per day. Now, this has to be given for a period of three months, followed by a maintenance phase. Now, if this is not received by the patient, very likely that he or she will not show signs of healing of rickets, and we will wrongly label that child as a non-nutritional rickets. So this is the first important perspective that needs to be kept in mind. So as we all know, rickets is a heterogeneous group. Lot of reasons, lot of causes could be acquired, could be inherited. But the underlying thing is there is disturbance of calcium and phosphate homeostasis that happens. Like we saw the bridge being formed, the cement being laid, the rods being put. So everything revolves around calcium and phosphorus. This revolving is a very complex, well-regulated process. Lot of factors are affecting. And what happens is there is longitudinal growth of the bone is determined by the activity of growth plate cartilage. That is GPC in the epiphysis. Like we saw, there were chondrocytes in the proliferative zone, which rapidly divide, align parallel to the direction of growth. Some of them differentiate into larger hypertrophic chondrocytes. That fat man was a perfect example to know the hypertrophic chondrocytes, which were there. Now, ideally, they should shrink down and go away by apoptosis or transdifferentiation into osteoblast and they form lacunae there, which get invaded by blood vessels and osteoprogenitors. And then the mature bone forms or the linear growth happens. Now what happens is the key term here for all of us to remember is this apoptosis, which is the key factor that causes rickets. And if this doesn't happen, we'll end up in rickets. So the calcium, the phosphorus ions are taken up by specific channels. They crystallize in order to form hydroxyapatite. And this propagates on collagen fibrils and mineralizes to extracellular in the matrix. 
Now, this picture on the right hand side that we can see shows the hyperplasia of the hypertrophic zone. Just a minute. Yeah. On the of the growth plate, this part. This this is the hypertrophic part of the growth plate. Now, calcium and phosphorus are the two major components. Now, important is there should be adequate as well as proportionate availability of both these molecules. Either or in excess or in deficiency will cause rickets. And this is a very important new concept that is coming up. That phosphorus concentration is directly involved in regulation of hypertrophic chondrocytes, apoptotic pathways in the growth plates. So if phosphorus is not there, the apoptosis does not happen. So this is a generic bone that we see, and we want the calcium to go there. So again, dietary deficiency, as we all saw, or if there is any malabsorption, this ergosterol gets converted to cholecalciferol. 25 hydroxy in the vitamin uh, in the liver gets 125 hydroxylase in the kidney, and this helps the calcium to get deposited in the bone. Now, any step that goes wrong in this pathway will cause problem. So there could be malabsorption, primary gut problem, or a liver disease. Or a renal disease like CKD or a vitamin D dependent rickett type one or type two. Whatever is the problem, the low calcium will stimulate the parathyroid by forming hyperparathyroidism, and this parathyroid hormone will start getting secreted and cause a lot of wasting of phosphorus. So eventually, what will happen is this PPH will come and cause phosphorus wasting. Also, likewise, phosphorus that is needed. Either because of whatever mechanism by phosphaturia, either selective or non-selective, will not get deposited. So in the end, either whether it is calcium deficiency or phosphorus deficiency, phosphorus is lost primarily because of PTH or PTH independent mechanisms and rickets ensues because of hampering of apoptosis. A third perspective to this is probably. Renal tubular acidosis, which happens and causes rickets. There has been a recent published paper uh, by Dr. Rajiv Sinha's group uh, on tubulopathies uh, from East India cohort, which has shown that distal RTA was the most commonest tubulopathy that they found in the genetic analysis, and that's why this is important that we understand how acidosis also causes rickets. So, if we divide this entire diagram into three groups, the left side. these are so called the calcipenic or vitamin d related rickets the right side which is phosphopenic rickets and the rickets in rta so now just i'll briefly brush through rickets in rta so that we can move ahead with the other parts metabolic acidosis increases urinary excretion of phosphorus now this is not very classically given in our undergraduate textbooks or even probably uh, smaller pediatric textbooks but yes metabolic acidosis increases urinary excretion of phosphorus now what happens is in the brush border of the proximal tubular epithelial cells there is brush border membrane vesicles which are there which are transporters which are sodium phosphorus co-transporters and these transporters are responsible for absorption of phosphorus from the tubular lumen now acidosis causes the blunting of expression of these transporters so these transporters are not able to function not able to absorb phosphorus and cause phosphaturia and eventually lead into rickets so like we saw whatever be the path be it calcipenic or vitamin d related rickets acidosis or phosphopenic rickets eventually there is renal phosphorus wasting that happens there is hypophosphatemia and impaired apoptosis of chondrocytes in the growth plate cartilage and that is the final common pathway for rickets to happen so now this is the new central molecule in rickets the new villain in rickets that is phosphorus now let us look at what mediates this gut bone kidney axis who are the players in this so first and foremost important thing is the pth which comes from parathyroid gland now what stimulates pth on the right hand side this is all that is causing stimulation of pth so decrease in calcium a decrease in vitamin d 125 vitamin d or a increase in phosphorus will cause pth to be released or rise in pth versus a raised calcium or raised vitamin d or a low phosphorus will cause suppression of pth eventually 
what happens is it directly stimulates renal calcium reabsorption and also stimulates the synthesis of 125 hydroxy vitamin D resulting in increased intestinal phosphorus and calcium absorption so calcium starts to rise vitamin D starts to rise and phosphorus starts to decrease because of stimulation of PTH so basically it's a phosphaturic hormone now a special time back sodium phosphorus transporters and the phosphorus transporter too in the brush border of the proximal tubular epithelial cell. Now reabsorption of phosphorus from tubular lumen is unidirectional. Okay, so like here you can see it just enters and then it exits from the basolateral membrane. It is not recirculated out again from the brush border. It is unidirectional and transcellular. Now, tubular capacity of phosphorus reabsorption depends on the abundance of these phosphorus carriers. How many carriers are there on the brush border and whether they are placed at the border and not internalized in the cell. So, the abundance of these four transporters eventually decides whether how much phosphorus will get absorbed or not. A lot of disorders are accountable because of these transporters based on genetic analysis, this which we'll see subsequently. So the net action of PTHS is enhancement. It enhances the circulating calcium levels and it reduces the circulating phosphorus levels. The second molecule that is important is FGF23, that is the fibroblast growth factor. Now this molecule is synthesized in the bone, in the osteocytes and the osteoblasts and in the teeth. The activity of this molecule is regulated by two genes, that is phosphate-regulating neutral endopeptidase homologue, that is the FEX gene, and the dentin matrix acid phosphoprotein, that is DMP1. Now, this molecule suppresses renal 125 hydroxylase enzyme and stimulates the degradation of 125 hydroxy molecule. Now, how does this do? Uh, how does this molecule act? It binds to its co-receptor clotho. And after binding, they activate the receptor of FGF. This causes internalization and degradation of the transporters that we just saw. That's why there is no absorption of phosphorus and it causes phosphorus wasting. So just to give you an overview, in normal situation, FGF23 comes, the FEX gene inactivates FGF, preventing it from overactivity, and that's how it is kept under check. In extinct hypophosphatemic rickets, as we will see, there is a mutation in this FEX gene. So this FGF23 goes unchecked and causes FGF excess, and this causes phosphaturia. Similar thing happens in autosomal dominant hypophosphatemia, where there is a FGF23 mutation up, up front, whereas the FEX is normal. So this FGF23, which is abnormal, is resistant to inactivation by this FEX. Therefore, it causes excess and therefore it causes phosphaturia. So FGF23 net action is reduction in 125 vitamin D levels and reduction in circulating phosphorus levels. This is in opposition to PTH action, which causes raised in vitamin D levels. Here it causes reduction in vitamin uh, D levels. So this is the summary and the interplay of these three organs. PTH, which is produced by parathyroid, has a stimulatory effect on vitamin D. Vitamin D has a stimulatory effect in turn on FGF23. FGF23 has an inhibitory effect on PTH. FGF23 also has an inhibitory effect on vitamin D levels. And vitamin D in feedback mechanism inhibits PTH. So now how do we go about analyzing these children on history and physical examination? So on history, be sure to ask whether this child is on any elemental or hypoallergenic formula or any parental nutrition, which can cause hypophosphatemic rickets by decreasing the availability of phosphorus to the child. Also these days, a lot of patients or families choose to adopt vegan kind of diet. And if they do not supplement adequate phosphorus, because they are not taking milk and milk products, child might be prone to hypophosphatemia. Is there any history of gastrointestinal surgery which may impair phosphorus absorption? Is the child on any long-term drugs like valproate, cisplatin, iphosphamide? These are all anti-neoplastic drugs or chemotherapy drugs or 
antibiotics, which can cause renal Fanconese syndrome or interfere with calcium and vitamin D metabolism. And is there any polypia, polydipsia, or failure to thrive, which can suggest renal Fanconese syndrome? It is Dr. very important. Sorry that to, Dr. Amol, sorry to interrupt you. Um, your voice breaks in between. I think it must be your Wi Fi. If you could close uh, your video, then I think it should be fine. So, yes, yes. so sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Just let Perfect. me know if it happens again. Yeah, sorry. Uh, if I may continue. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so we will, what is important is to take a three, at least a three generation family history to ask, is there somebody with a bone deformity in the family? For example, if there is an extinct recessive inheritance that you find in the family tree, typically 50% of the offsprings of affected females, all daughters, but no sons of the affected males, if that is the situation, then it hints to an extinct recessive kind of inheritance. But also to remember that about 30% of extinct hypophosphatemic rickets are due to de novo mutations and a family history might not be present. A autosomal dominant inheritance straight away tells that there is autosomal dominant hypophosphatemic rickets possibility that is happening. And if there are unaffected parents but affected siblings, there is a chance that there is autosomal recessive pattern, which could be seen in VDDR types, all the subtypes. The recessive type of hypophosphatemic rickets and hypophosphatemia, nephrocalcinosis, and nephropathic cystinosis, that is Fanconese. On physical examination, we should not forget to look for anemia with or without hypertension, which could be a marker to CKD. There could be symptomatic hypocalcemia in the form of seizures, tetany, and hypotonia, which could hint to vitamin D dependent rickets, partial or complete alopecia which is again VDDR type 2, at all ages, try and look for disproportionate short stature or in infants, especially craniosynostosis. We all look for a wide open fontanel to look for rickets, but also try to move our hand little ahead to look for craniosynostosis. Probably it could give a hint to hereditary forms of FGF23 mediated rickets. If there are caffeole macules present, it could hint to mccune albright syndrome or fibrous dysplasia. If there are adolescent children, and they have periodontitis, pseudofractures, Arnold Chari malformation, it could hint to again extinct type of rickets, and again hypercalcemia, nephrocalcinosis, and renal stones. Now, coming to labs and calculations, what we do, these are the series of tests that we would usually order. And depending on the results, we will calculate certain indices. So there are blood tests and urine tests. Specific, again, vitamin D both 25 hydroxy vitamin D and 125 dihydroxy vitamin D needs to be ordered depending on the clinical scenario. PTH has to be ordered. So we'll just look at what are the caveats that we need for evaluating and knowing this test. These are the calculations that we need to make uh, estimated GFR. Don't go by the lab value of uh, report of creatinine, which is in normal range. Always use the modified Schwartz formula to calculate GFR and to see GFR is normal or no. Because in most forms of rickets, GFR has to be normal. If GFR is low, it could hint at CKD and we might miss a renal failure patient. Urine calcium creatinine ratio, phosphate creatinine ratio and these calculations as we will subsequently see. General rules, this might not always be true, but mostly these are general, which can help us to give us direction. All kinds of calciponic rickets will have early onset, may have tetany, will have low calcium and high PTH. If there is acidosis but no renal failure, probably RTA. So this child will have failure to thrive, polyuria, acidotic breathing, and we might pick up nephrocalcinosis on ultrasound. Whereas phosphopenic rickets, usually it's little older child, otherwise asymptomatic, presenting with limb deformities. That too more in the lower limbs as compared to upper limbs, normal calcium, normal PTH. Now, whenever we order serum phosphorus, we have seen serum phosphorus will be low in all forms. And as compared to calcipenic, in phosphopenic rickets, it will be even more suppressed or low. Now, one thing that we need to remember is there are age-dependent cutoffs for normal values of phosphorus. On the right-hand side, we can see this is a table of normal age-based calcium and age-based phosphorus. Calcium does not vary much 
with age 8.8 to 8.9 lower limit phosphorus at the variability right from 4.8 to 2.3 the lower limit cutoffs are extremely different children are known to uh, acquire phosphorus for their rapid growth so the normal values are slightly on the higher side as compared to older children these normal values have to be kept in mind while interpreting reports like for example if i get a child who is two and a half year old or a three year old child with a phosphorus of 3.2 i should not brush him off by saying normal because lab says 2.3 to 4.5 is normal for his age that value is not normal also there are a lot of general variants phosphorus values are lowest in early morning that has to be kept in mind and there are variations with diet younger children who predominantly have milk as a source of their calories or nutrition immediately after a bout of milk if they give a blood sample serum phosphorus values might falsely be abnormal that's why the preferred sample is a morning fasting sample that is to be given for serum phosphorus serum calcium ideally ionized calcium wherever available can be used should be used if not available if there is hypoalbuminemia that albumin has to be corrected the lab report has to be corrected for of calcium has to be corrected for albumin serum, serum alkaline phosphatase is a marker of osteoblastic activity generally raised in all forms of rickets this is the characteristic test of all forms of rickets the only place where there are bony deformities and alkaline phosphatase is not raised is phosphatasia what tangavelu sir showed which needs a stem cell transplant now also important to remember in all children about 80 to 90% of alkaline phosphatase is bone origin so we don't need not ask for a bone specific alkaline phosphatase in adults almost 50% comes from liver so it causes confusion but in children we can totally rely on the total alkaline phosphatase that is there normal and al reduced alkaline phosphatase values could also be seen in blount's disease metaphyseal dysplasia and hypophosphatasia which are mimics now what is tubular reabsorption of phosphate all of us are used to calculating fractional excretion of sodium fractional excretion of other solutes of calcium this is fractional excretion of phosphorus minus the 100% that happens so this is a marker of how much phosphorus is reabsorbed from the tubules now the caveat here is it might not be 100% reliable because it does not allow for amount of filtered phosphorus now if my serum phosphorus is very very low like say 2.2 or 2.1 my kidney might absorb entire thing back and my tubular reabsorption of phosphate might be normal and it might it might not show wasting so it can give me a false report so what is a better value is a tubular maximum of phosphate reabsorption divided by gfr now this value corresponds to theoretical lower limit of serum phosphate below which all filtered phosphate will be reabsorbed how do we calculate this there are two formula which are available one nomogram which is available and in today's era of technology a online calculator is also available the link for which i have given but this does not differentiate between calcipenic and phosphopenic rickets now this nomogram we are all used to seeing on my left hand axis is the serum phosphorus concentration the right part of this is in milligrams per deciliter and on the right this is millimole per liter and this is the trp that we are supposed to calculate the easier way to do is whatever is the serum phosphate concentration draw a line joining this and the trp and it will tell you tmp upon gfr value this is the nomogram that is used for easy calculation of tmp upon gfr so these are the formula again if trp is less than 0.86 the formula to be used is trp into serum phosphate if trp is greater than 0.6 the formula is 0.3 into trp divided by 1 subtracted by 0.8 times the trp multiplied by serum value of phosphorus fgf 23 levels now this molecule is available in probably research laboratories or very high end laboratories probably not available to all centers so we need to be very very sure whether we want to order this and whether we'll be able to interpret this correctly or not this determines whether phosphate wasting is secondary to fgf 23 axis 
for this we need a edta sample and the sample must be centrifuged immediately as moment the sample is taken because if it is not centrifuged immediately the levels de decrease it might give a false low levels if patient is on conventional treatment for example we have started treatment and the patient is not improving we are suspecting non nutritional it is better to send samples after one two weeks of discontinuation of treatment and not while the patient is on treatment so now coming to interpretation of all the lab reports that we have done so in vitamin d deficiency reports we saw calcium will be low phosphorus may be low or normal alkaline phosphatase will be raised pts will be raised vitamin d will be low whereas in hereditary forms of dependent rickets calcium will be low phosphorus may be normal or low or low normal alkaline phosphatase is raised pts will again be high because like we saw there is secondary hyperparathyroidism in phosphopenic rickets in nutritional phosphate deficiencies calcium is normal phosphorus is low alkaline phosphatase is high pts is again low or normal not raised because this is just phosphate deficiency vitamin d is normal and 125 hydroxy vitamin d is raised because of hyperparathyroidism excellent hypophosphatemic rickets and autosomal uh, dominant and recessive hypophosphatemic rickets the calcium will be normal phosphorus is low in all the categories alkaline phosphatase is raised but pth is normal or slightly raised inappropriately normal now this is for a typical scenario like us where fgf23 is not available what if fgf23 was available freely to us so this is the nomogram or a flow chart so if you have a low phosphate level measure the pth level pth level could be high or normal if it is normal it is phosphopenic rickets measure urinary wasting of phosphorus so if urine phosphorus is low it is either insufficient phosphate intake decrease in gastrointestinal absorption of phosphate or some redistribution if urinary phosphate is high the next step is to measure fgf23 if fgf23 is normal or low we know it is hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria or fanconies that means there is generalized wasting from the kidney not specific to phosphorus but if fgf23 is high there is hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets or any acquired forms of hypophosphatemic rickets due to high fgf23 versus if pth is high with signs of rickets and low phosphorus we measure serum vitamin d levels if vitamin d levels are low and 125 hydroxy vitamin d is also low it is a pointer to vitamin d dependent rickets type 1b or 3 if vitamin 125 vitamin d levels are normal or high it suggest nutritional vitamin d deficiency if levels of 25 hydroxy are no normal or high but 125 is low it is vddr type 1a versus if both are high that is 25 hydroxy as well as 125 hydroxy it is vddr type 2a or 2b so now we'll just go quickly through important salient features of these diseases so again three groups these labels are put on every slide vitamin d dependent or it is phospho due to fgf23 excess or phospopenic disorders with normal or suppressed fgf23 coming first to vitamin d dependent rickets types there are basically five types divided into 1 2 and 3 the first type that is vddr type 1a is because of failure in complete activation of calcitriol due to inability to generate 125 so the problem is at the 1 alpha hydroxylase step 1b is due to complete failure in complete activation of calcitriol due to inability to generate 25 hydroxy type 2 are related to receptor of vitamin d so 2a is calcitriol resistant due to mutations in the receptor itself and 2b is alteration in receptor to dna interaction post the interaction of vitamin d to its receptor and type 3 is abnormal inactivation of vitamin d metabolites so type 1a is symptomatic in early infancy presenting with skeletal signs of rickets failure to thrive hypotonia irritability tetany or fractures in cases of late diagnosis 
type one b show similar phenotype, but may improve slowly with age. VDDR type two a and two b have severe hypocalcemia in infancy. About fifty percent patients have alopecia. They are failed to grow eyelashes and eyebrows because of the disrupted vitamin D receptor, which is needed for hair follicle growth. VDDR type three is extremely rare and has features similar to type one. Now, dietary phosphate deficiency children who are this at risk population, very low birth weight infants who do not receive any phosphate supplementation, or on a special diet or surgical. intervention has been done or a short bowel syndrome is there coming to x linked hypophosphatemia this is the prototype disorder of renal phosphate wasting which is dominant inherited disorder like we saw there are mutations in the fex gene about 90% of these cases are familial because of the mutation of fex gene fgf23 does not get inactivated and there is Renal phosphate waste. Multiple mechanism fex causes hypophosphatemia. This fex gene is known to encode for an endopeptidase, which affects expression of FGF twenty three. It also causes indirect cleavage of pro protein, and the malfunction of fex causes increased synthesis of osteopontin, which impairs bone mineralization. clinical symptoms usually develop around the age of walking and resemble other forms of rickets specific features are disproportionate short stature dental abscesses craniosynostosis and sensory neural hearing loss there are autosomal dominant type of hypophosphatemic rickets this happen because of activating pathogenic variants of fgf gene there is incomplete penetrance so variable presentation is there and usually symptomatic after childhood so as a pediatrician or a pediatric subspecialist there is a chance that this might be adolescent child who comes who might or might not report to us maybe as an adult and here the important part is iron status in this these patients are an important regulator of fgf23 so iron deficiency might just predispose this patient if the patient gets iron deficiency anemia he might start developing bone pains and enthesopathies and other musculoskeletal complaints might not come directly to light as a rickets patient the recessive forms of hypophosphatemic rickets now this happens because of the two regulatory genes of fgf23 that is dmp1 and enpp1 and both are expressed in bone and teeth and this is characterized with increase fgf23 levels there are certain cutaneous diseases like epidermal nevi and congenital melanocytic nevi which present with pathological excess of fgf23 and they will have phosphorus wasting now one thing that comes with stones or hypercalciuria with rickets is this hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria which is due to mutation of slc34a3 family which codes for the sodium phosphorus co-transporters now what happens is there is increase in 125 hydroxy vitamin concentration causes hypercalcemia low th levels nephrosis and nephrolithiasis clinical symptoms and changes in biochemical parameters may be very very subtle now that is why it is very very important to send a urinary calcium to creatinine ratio in all patients who present with rickets which are non nutritional this is the only way we'll pick it up clinically without ordering a genetic test lastly there could be a renal fanconi syndrome which is a generalized proximal tubular dysfunction which presents with glycosuria hypokalemia some proteinuria a good urine report a urine routine report will help us pick this up and we have to remember that this could be primary or secondary and there could be underlying problem like cystinosis lowes syndrome fanconi bickel and some drugs especially anti epileptics which can cause fanconies incomplete fanconies is sometimes seen in dense disease which presents with non specific proteinuria and hypercalciuria there could be some iatrogenic causes like cisplatin which we have seen now how do we manage these children the goals of management is to correct and improve rickets monitor growth and puberty watch for adverse effects of therapy this is again a general scheme this is good scheme to remember if there is calcifenic rickets give native vitamin d or active vitamin d depending on the disease importantly supplement with calcium do not forget calcium supplementation
if there is an excellent hypophosphatemic rickets, there is a new drug called borosumab, which has come, which is a monoclonal antibody about which we will see. If there is a phosphate wasting, which is FGF23 mediated, give phosphorus and active vitamin D. If we do not give active vitamin D, the rickets will go on worsening. Versus if there is phosphorus wasting, which is independent of FGF23, just a good oral phosphorus supplementation will take care. So if there is VDDR type of rickets, which is calcipanic rickets, lifelong supplementation 25-hydroxy vitamin has to be given, which is to be given twice daily due to short half-life. Alternatively, calcidiol can be given once a day because of its long half-life. You see here, those requirements are not body based. So this is type 1A, type 1B, VDDR type 2 and VDDR type 3. So here what we in type 1A that we need to give is calcitriol or active form of vitamin D. In type 1B, because there is a problem in 25 hydroxylation, give calcidiol. And in type 2, we again need to give activated vitamin D. So this is just the repetition of what we have seen. Now a point to note in type 2 uh, vitamin D dependent rickets is in early infancy, we could just manage by giving high doses of normal calcium. We might not have to give vitamin D because at this stage, the intestinal absorption of calcium is independent of vitamin D. And it usually restores normal calcium and normalizes PTH also in first few months. However, in later, vitamin this is a typo error after early infancy vitamin d is needed now sometimes children might not give us time to give oral corrections like what we saw in tangavelusa's case we need to give iv calcium probably continuously for probably months until the child becomes fit to get oral calcium now extinct hypophosphatemia in probably middle income and lower income group countries where yet borosumab might be out of reach of common people phosphorus has to be given about 20 to 60 milligram per kg along with calcitriol or alpha calcidiol now treatment with active vitamin d also improves remineralization of skeleton by enhancing vitamin d dependent intestinal calcium and phosphorus reabsorption the target PTH that we have to maintain is about 10 to 65 picogram per ml. And whenever we send PTH samples, it has to be an ice sample and a free-flowing blood sample that has to be sent in an EDTA tube to the laboratory. Now what happens with conventional treatment that we give? Sometimes if we give too much of vitamin D, it can cause hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis, which is about reported in about 30 to 70% of patients. We can give hydrochlorothiazide to reduce the hypercalciuria. By convention, if we try to give potassium citrate, this to prevent calcium precipitation, it can cause risk of phosphate precipitation also. So we have to be extremely careful by giving potassium citrate for hypercalciuria in hypophosphatemic rickets. Now, if PTH levels still continue to rise, we can increase the dose of active vitamin D or decrease slightly the dose of phosphorus that we are giving. If it's still high, role of sinacalcid, uh, which could be used to decrease hyperparathyroidism, but again, this is not licensed for this indication. Now, this for a PGs and uh, fellows in training, this could be MCQ questions. New molecule in market, borosumab, which is a humanized monoclonal antibody against FGF23. This is just licensed to be used in children more than a year of age for hypophosphatemic rickets, which can be started if there is radiographic evidence of overt bone disease, if a child is refracted to conventional therapy, or there have been some complications, or patients' inability to adhere to conventional therapy, presuming that adequate monitoring is feasible. But it is recommended that the national FDA guidelines of respective countries have to be borne in mind before starting this drug. There are guidelines on how to start the drug. We usually start with 0.8 milligram per kg, subcutaneously every two weeks, and we increase it in increments of 0.4 milligram every four weeks to see adequate response. The maximum dose in children is 2 milligram per kg. Absolute dose is 90 milligram, not to exceed 90 milligram per dose. And it should not be adjusted more frequently than four weeks. While the patient is 
on borosumab treatment we have to monitor is fasting phosphate levels which has to be done every 2 weeks during first month every 4 weeks in subsequent 2 months and thereafter as appropriate other recommendations are if phosphate levels become normal we have to withhold the therapy with borosumab and wait till it again falls down we should not be giving in normal phosphate levels contraindications are alongside conventional treatment it should not happen that we are treating with both the modalities with phosphate levels being normal we have to stop the treatment in severe renal impairment if there is renal impairment causing rickets we do not have to give this and there has to be adequate contraception in sexually active females adolescent girls while they are on borosumab treatment so there is this paper what happens when we actually start in the real world so there is a study published in pediatric nephrology journal where twelve children were studied and with borosumab they showed increased serum phosphate a good drop of alkaline phosphate is good control of pth decrease in urinary phosphate wasting decrease in radiographic rickets and a improvement in their height scores but we will also have to see long term what happens with borosumab the problem with countries like india and surrounding countries it's an expensive drug uh, the cost for a 20 gram vial like the maintenance dose is about 1 uh, mg per kg that's 20 mg a 20 gram vial comes to about 35000 indian rupees which is about and if you're giving by like every fortnightly the cost comes to about 70000 per month that is about 880 us dollars per month for a 20 kg child so we don't know how many of us will be able to prescribe this to our patients uh the other adjunctive therapies that we use are growth hormone if the height is not increasing but it is not recommended as a routine treatment for hypophosphatemic children they might be considered only after alkaline phosphatase and pth are well controlled but again that's a weak recommendation for use of growth hormone now this is a very practical thing uh, that a orthopedic refers to us for fitness saying give fitness that the child has to be taken up for surgery or we send for fit, uh, child for corrective surgeries so a premature surgical correction is not recommended previously osteotomies used to be done now guided growth techniques are uh, utilized by orthopedic surgeons to correct this deformities surgery should be performed after a period of about 3 to 6 months of intense therapy to achieve a good metabolic control and once the alkaline phosphatase levels are low dental interventions are needed every 6 months the at least dental visits are to be done every 6 monthly to see if dental hygiene and the pits and fissures are sealed off this is very very important for overall care of children with dental issues in excellent hypophosphatemic rickets how do we monitor these children we follow up in our clinic every 3 monthly dental examination twice a year vitamin d levels to be done once a year calcium creatinine ratio in the urine and 125 hydroxy vitamin d levels every 3 to 6 monthly to be done in a paired fashion blood pressure monitoring ideally every visit or at least twice a year to look for hypertension and renal ultrasound to look for nephrocalcinosis every once or twice a year are there any potential new treatments other than borosumab probably clotho fgf receptor complex can be targeted or the fgf receptor itself can be targeted for newer modalities there is a fgf receptor antagonist that is undergoing trials probably will come to market very soon and other modalities which can be explored to treat renal phosphate wasting disorders which are fgf23 mediated thank you thank you i don't know if i have exceeded our time thank you so much thank you so much dr amol this was excellent the way you differentiated the calcipenic rickets from phosphopenic rickets and then you know the way to approach phosphopenic rickets and then going all the way to newer modalities of treatment which are available uh in different countries so this was an excellent talk uh thank you so much uh, for sharing all your uh, uh experience and with this we will open the session uh, for discussion we do have a few questions in the chat we would like the attendees to put uh, their questions in the chat directly 
and we would discuss them one by one. And to start the discussion, I would uh, start with a couple Chairman. of questions which are in the chart. Chairperson. And, and Dr. Namalwar, yes, please go ahead. Can you, can you give me two minutes permission to talk? Chairperson. Yes, sure, sir. You can go ahead, sir. Yes, yes, please go ahead, Dr. Sir. It is, sir, you have to unmute the, sir, you have to unmute the mic. Sir, sir can you unmute? Ah. Hey, I've done that. No? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, today's uh, presentation is, uh, I mean, uh, really an excellent presentation and it's the most popular topic. I've been watching the participants with persistently 91 throughout the lecture. It's very rare in most of our lectures. It goes down. That shows how popular it is. I congratulate Kalevani for this wonderful choice of these subjects. Second thing is Dr. Tangavilu. Today's presentation is a masterpiece. I so all of us will agree. But I but but I don't know many of you know it's a product of 22 years of work. It's a product of 22 years of work. I have with me the uh, proceedings of the uh, proceedings of the CME program in pediatric pathology in the year 2000. Dr. Uh, uh, Tangavelu has written an article on. Tickets and I don't know whether you're able to see here. If I put it on the book here, this book, so you look very carefully, you know, you're able to see here. Tickets. This is one of the articles is Tickets uh, and the Kidney in 2000, published in this book. Now you can understand what he has done. It's nothing, it's nothing wonderful. He has done a piece of hard work and kind of thing. I congratulate him for this wonderful presentation. And of course, as usual, our friend doctor has taken a difficult topic and present nicely. Thank you very much. It's been a happy. Please, excuse me, you can go ahead with your talk. Sir, thank you, sir. It's all what you gave us, sir. You only gave all these things. We have just cleaned it, presented you after 20 years, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever uh, we we have, it's only from your own things. So you, no, you have mentored us, sir. Thank you so we much. We have been on that subject for 22 years. That's I wanted them, all of you, to know. It's not one day reading from the textbook and putting it up for journal. It is a hard work that has been done in the last two, two years. That's the thing. I hope you remember that article you wrote. You yes, may sir. not have remembered. Actually, <laughs> thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, Dr. Amul is such a complex topic. I thought I may not be able to understand your slides. It's beautiful slides. Very simplistic no, slides. Colorful. You give a lot of idea about a complex topic. Fantastic, Amul. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I mean, we have learned from you and Namalwar, sir. His books we have been reading, we have attending his lectures and our lectures. And probably we are the third generation and many more generations to come. I mean, we'll be passing that on, hopefully in a better way to all the other coming students. The way you presented hypophosphatemia, hypophosphatemia is the most difficult topic to understand. You've done it very simple, very, very neatly and simply. I hope uh, the listeners have benefited. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Namalwar, for sharing uh, this uh, history. And this is really important uh, for our students and for us to understand. So thank you, Dr. Thangavelu, sir, again, you know, for an excellent talk. And thank you, uh, Dr. Amol, as well. We will start with our question answer session. The first question here uh, in the chat is, can you elaborate on vitamin D resistant and dependent rickets types and uh, differentiating features? I think this question had come more at the start of the talk. And um, uh, Dr. Amol has gone into the details of it. Uh, uh, so if you want to briefly uh, say, Dr. Amol, that's fine. Uh, I think you did go very much in, into details through your entire lecture. So maybe we can skip to the next question. Oh, awesome. I think, uh, this one is for Dr. Uh, Tangavelu, sir. Good evening, sir. Shall we give 60,000 IU to children less than one year or 2,000 IU per day, which is safe and preferred? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, it is everybody is trying to balance compliance and response of the treatment against toxicity. That's what I aim. So, 60,000 international units will definitely give a good compliance, good response, but there is definitely a risk of toxicity. That is why the Indian IAP standard treatment guidelines are prescribed only for children above six months. Below six months, they are likely to develop toxicity. So, by giving 2,000 interest units, we are definitely there is a risk of toxicity is very, very less. But there is a poor compliance and the end result is probably we may not be 
aiming at healing the rickets. So that's why probably we'll have to balance the effect of toxicity versus success of healing of the rickets. As uh, again, I will repeat it, below six months, probably only daily 2,000 to 3,000 units, 2,000 units per day is the right choice. Above six months, probably we can use uh, larger doses like 30,000 till one year and beyond one year, 60,000 international units. I was told by one of the persons, experts in that uh, STG, the whole treatment game is aiming at uh, vitamin D toxicity, at the same time trying to heal the rickets. Hope I have answered your question. No, thank you, Dr. Sir, uh, Dr. Thangavelu, sir. I think uh, you were very clear in your talk that, uh, you know, the mega doses is completely no. And I think that is a very clear message to all our students that mega doses should not be used. But even when it comes to daily versus uh, the smaller doses, 60,000 units, I think daily is preferred, as you mentioned, and uh, monitoring for toxicity does become uh, important. The question that I have for you, sir, is like, when we are monitoring for toxicities, when do we actually check the labs? You know, uh, at what point in time we should check for, uh, you know, vitamin D level again? At what point in time, you know, we should check for, uh, you know, hypercalciuria or so? Uh, should it be four weeks? Should it be eight weeks into the treatment? Any thoughts on that? I may not be more experienced in this, but generally we check after four weeks. Because earlier we used to give weekly ones. After four weeks, we used to check the vitamin D levels. Only on two occasions, I ended up seeing a child with vitamin D toxicity. But actually, the child had a one child had an obvious clinical presentation, the form of polyuria, and a nephrocalcium was identified by the ultrasound. Second occasion, where they came with the history of giving a larger dose inadvertently, only these two occasions, probably Dr. Kalevani or Amul may be able to tell it correctly. We don't routinely monitor for toxicity. And uh, so I request Dr. Amul or Kalevani to answer this question. Now, if the prescribed dose, we are sure that uh, we have seen the prescription, seen the drug, and the parent is comfortable and reliable enough to tell us that he has taken, there's no reason to suspect toxicity. We might not test the calcium creatine ratio or ultrasound. If there is no symptom or there is no suspicion of overdosing. I mean, that is my take on it. I mean, uh, Kalevani ma'am or uh, any seniors. Involved. I think uh, it's the same answer with me as well. So unless we suspect toxicity, we don't routinely uh, do ultrasound or look for a calcium free at value. Yes, Dr. Namalwar, sir, any thoughts from your side? Biaran, sir. Sir is muted. Yeah. We'll wait for his opinion. And um, um, meanwhile, yeah, I mean, we do similar things here. We don't routinely check for uh, toxicity and uh, unless the suspicion is high. Uh, but as uh, I think uh, both uh, Dr. Amol and Dr. Thangal mentioned, that toxicity is something we should keep in mind, especially with all those uh, different formulations of vitamin D which are there. And if it inadvertently, you know, if it's given wrong, then we could have some uh, toxicities and uh, monitoring them in, you know, especially when it's a prolonged therapy, especially when the treatment is being given for a longer period of time and you're not seeing a response, then I think the role of uh, ultrasounds and the role of uh, uh, checking for uh, uh, toxicities makes sense. So I no, have, thank you. I have a question about that, Amrish. Uh, we don't, our IEP recommends uh, no need to give vitamin, a, vitamin D supplements after one year. But I have seen almost or, uh, around 10 cases of serious vitamin D deficiency in older kids. Two, three cardiomyopathies. One child came with recurrent seizures. A lot of... So what is your... Uh, what what uh, strategy you follow there in yours? Do you supplement vitamin D routinely? Of course, you may not, I think, because of the food supplements. But what is your routine? Do you uh, supplement vitamin D after one year? So routine, routinely, we do not supplement okay. vitamin D, but at the same time, more and more uh, pediatricians are being encouraged to actually check a vitamin D. So, for example, you know, I live in Michigan and here half of the year we don't even see sun. So we know that the vitamin D deficiency is going to be high. We may not see full blown signs of rickets here. But at the same time, we do see, you know, difficult to treat vitamin D deficiency. 
mainly because we deal with African-American population and then that's how uh, the conversion is not as uh, easy. And that's how we check vitamin D even during routine visits. So if a pedi- they're coming to a pediatrician visit, then vitamin D would be checked. And a lot of time we actually are challenged to get the vitamin D even above 20s. It still r- remains below 20 in spite of regular supplementation. Uh, I can give my own personal experience. My vitamin D always stays low here. You know, somehow it's not coming up. I mean, I've been taking on a regular dose, you know, routine vitamin D and still uh, it's not coming up. I think I just need to come to India and it will come up. So <laughs> now our sons also do not see the sunlight. I mean, SONs are not seeing SUNs. Right. <laughs> don't see the sun. So I just want to, Kalimani, I just want to express. I did not express my thanks to Dr. Saravanan Singaram Gaddi, who presented the video to me from YouTube that... Uh, Oh, in this video, I just forgot to add this in my last slide to thank you. I just, in the form, I just like to thank Dr. Saranan Singaram for giving me that video. Sure, sir. Thank you. The message will be conveyed, sir. I think he's there. <laughs> <laughs> the other, other thing I want to discuss is about the role of Borsumab. And um, uh, Dr. Amol really, you know, compiled all the information very nicely. I think that's all we know about this newer drug. And um, I want to hear your experiences. Have you had a chance to use it? And, uh, you know, has it been, is it being used in uh, India or not? And uh, you mentioned about the cost factor, which is definitely a big issue. Uh, so I want to I hear from you. And then definitely I want to share my experience, what we have here. So, uh, No, it is not very commonly used in India. I have never come across any of my, myself or any other pediatric nephrology colleagues or seniors who have used. So personal experience that way is not there. And probably the reason is because uh, the cost. And because it's not very old drug also that uh, and it's hardly been three years that it has come. So probably it's not yet come into vogue and we are not used to using it. So probably another two, three years, probably we will have some answers from the Indian uh, front. Yes, probably. the drug is not freely available as well. Yeah, because I think we have to give an online application with everything and then the distributor sends it to us. It's not freely available. So that is the reason we are not been using. Yeah. No, I think that's good to know. And I can share my personal experience here. Um, as you mentioned, it's only been a few years. I think uh, the here in US FD approved in 2018. So it's right around, you know, three or four years now. And um, I think it's a wonder drug. That is what it is it has really changed the management of hypophosphatemic rickets uh, a whole sum. I've had patients who were on phosphorus, calcitriol, you know, bone changes, underwent osteotomies, and still we could never get the phosphorus above 2 or 2.5. And uh, as we switched them from uh, their supplementations to borsumab, and, and to, for, the, for the students and all that, you have to actually stop all the supplements before you start the drug. That is the first thing you do. So you stop the calcitriol, you stop the phosphorus, you get the ba- baseline levels, and then you start this medicine, uh, which is every two weeks uh, subcutaneously. We have seen tremendous response here. I, like My entire group has about seven or eight patients who are on this drug. Myself, I have two patients uh, who are on it. And we were we did not start any supplementations after that, and their phosphorus levels have been in the normal range, and we have seen their improvements in growths. We have seen improvement in Boeing. Uh, definitely, you know, I feel this is one of the medicines which has made management of hypophosphatemic rickets, you know, much easier, and they don't have to go through all the bony abnormalities and all. Uh, there is a caveat to it that, yes, I mean, you there is indications. And again, Dr. Amol, really, you know, you summarize the indications very nicely that it has to be X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. That is what uh, it is approved for. And um, FGF23, uh, we do check before starting that. And then because the indication is very clear that this has to be X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets, we do end up doing genetic studies also so as to confirm it uh, uh, that this is X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets so that the insurance can pay for it. 
So that is how we get the advantage that, uh, you know, the insurance could uh, pay for it and the families don't have to pay for it. But uh, the, ex you know, the response is, uh, uh, is really amazing. And uh, the side effect profile is very minimal. Definitely, it is just monitoring uh, for, uh, you know, actually going on the higher side, making sure that we are not hyperphosphatemic. And that is why, again, as you mentioned, that as you get into the normal range of phosphorus, then you may have to hold the medicine. Uh, but the patient that I have, we have continued them, you know, for the last two years now, and they have done really well. So I hope, you know, it comes to the Indian market soon and uh, with, a, with a favorable cost. Is there Thanks an age that. limit? Is there an age limit? More than one year, Dr. Namalwar, sir. They have to be more than a year old uh, for, uh, for it to be given. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any other questions here uh, in the chat. Dr. Namalwar, sir, any other comments or questions that you would have? or any of the panelists, any questions? Uh, just uh, go a little away from science. Uh, when, sir, I was doing post-graduation in 87, the time uh, that Namalwar sir used to dictate, I used to write it about the rickets. And then the first book of period nephrology was published. My name was, that was the first time I see my name in the print. I was so excited to see that and then politely, at the same time, I had a guilty consciousness because I didn't contribute anything scientifically. I asked him, sir, I, I, I just wrote what he told me, like a stenographer. What made you to include me as a co-author? You know, the word he said is, it's a lesson for all the teachers. He said, your father and mother has to give some property to the children to survive. Similarly, a teacher got an opportunity and got the responsibility to give, include them in the academic uh, uh, ground. I have seen those in the fifth, I have seen, he said there is not the same word. I have seen in American Journal of Nephrology, there are names in the fifth or sixth, now I have come to the first names. They all grown up to become professors in this thing. So, and nothing, nothing big, it is a responsibility of every teacher to introduce a student to the academic arena. I don't know how many of us uh, follow that. So, still we are all grateful to him for mentoring us. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Tangvalu, for this. Thank you. Thank you, Velu. Okay, I think if there's no more questions, then we will move to the next se section, which is, uh, you know, what we have been waiting for all this while. And that is the announcement for the winners for the polling sessions. So I would leave that for Dr. Kalavani to go over it. So before we could go into the announcement for the polling session, we have got uh, one more session extended, which is on August 24th. Uh, that is the last session. And we have the key speaker in for the last session. Um, and we'll be discussing on the most interesting topic that is electrolytes and how your tubules are going to handle it. And uh, the next thing is uh, the winners of the polling session are... The first place is none other than our own student, Dr. Arpita, who is our uh, pediatric nephrology fellow here. And the second place is uh, Dr. Aishwarya. She's from Stanley Medical College. And the third place goes to uh, Dr. Vedika Bhatt. She's uh, from uh, Indira Gandhi Inst Child Institute of Bangalore. Uh, thanks for your uh, contribution. And they had been very consistent in uh, participating in the polling session. Thank you so much. And the honoring for the polling session will be done on August 24th. Namalva said, you have anything to tell about the winners? And one more thing I would like to share is like uh, today morning, like uh, we were looking into the polling session uh, winners and uh, it was interesting that uh, the first place has, was actually occupied by one uh, Dr. Abdul. And then we subsequently um, messaged him uh, 
uh, asking for his details but then we got to know that he is uh, not a trainee but uh, a consultant but then like uh, we were amazed he just said that i just took part in the polling session just to refresh my knowledge and not to win any uh, cash rewards <laughs> thank you so much dr amal he had been very uh, genuine enough in uh, telling that he is not a trainee and he is a consultant and the trainees has to be rewarded thank you dr abdul Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kalamani. You set some really tough questions for the polling session. And I can tell you that even I enjoyed answering those questions. And I'm sure I would be, you know, way down. So, so thank you, you know, for creating such a different, uh, such a difficult polling session. And uh, this was a great learning experience. Congratulations. One more information I gathered is all the three places are taken by ladies. <laughs> so really they're dominating there. I think uh, <laughs> nephrology is in right now actually is right now we're in Chennai it's in the hands of the ladies <laughs> and uh, very few men come across it so but mothers are always that, great sir uh, mothers that, are always uh, great we have to congratulate these young ladies for their interest and I hope they sustain it and lead it to take it thank you ma thank you sir Tangavelu, sir, like uh, no one can actually compete with your uh, presentation. It's oh, like no, 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 good no. holds good for you, sir. Always better than yesterday. You can compare only with yourself. No one else can be compared. Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> Dr. Amul, you really made the very, very complex topic very simple for us. It was really an excellent uh, talk. Colorful slides and very simple. Very simple. I didn't expect that. Very practical things. In this topic. Huh? Actually, he has actually drilled the complex topic into us. <laughs> hmm. It is sliced into small pieces so that we can swallow. No, I, I, I like the fat uh, guy, the hypertrophic chondrocyte guy. And I think uh, you all chose the correct person to, I mean, a phenotypically correct person to describe uh, renal rickets. So those of who have seen me, I am maybe no. like him. So that was nice. Thank you, Dr. Amrish. Thank Thanks you. for your excellent participation. We'll all meet in the next session. It is not on Saturday. The next uh, session will be on Wednesday. It's on August 24th. And uh, on August 24th is a uh, final session for this series. Yeah, so please join, you know, for the final session. And we have an excellent keynote speaker coming uh, the, on, the, on August 24th. And then we will have a vote of thanks also. And we will recognize all the winners as well. So please join us for the one last final session for this year, which will be August 24th. Thank you once again to all the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Namalwar. Thank you, Dr. Tengavelu. Thank you, Dr. Amol. And thank you, Dr. Kalavani. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, Dr. Jain. Thank you, Amol. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.